I'd like to issue a quick little throwdown to John. John, hey, my name is Scott, and I am a fan of Shopsmith Pools. And if you're watching this video, there's a chance you're here because of John Malecki's video where he, well, let's just say he had a strong opinion about Shopsmith Pools. So uh, this video is to maybe address some of his concerns and also to issue him a little bit of a throwdown. Um, I think just right off the bat, I've watched his video a couple times over, and I think his concerns fall into just a couple categories, some of which I believe are common to non-Shopsmith users. And I think even us Shopsmith pool users, prior to being Shopsmith pool users, shared some of those concerns. And they were things such as, gosh, is it too complex to assemble? Is it too complex to align? Um, is it, uh, it rinky-dink? Is it a toy? Um, is it going to be constantly coming out of alignment, being fussy? Is it going to take too much time to set up and so on? And is it a safe tool? I want to address a number of those concerns. And part of my thinking as I thought about this is how to address them. Um, I think by, I start by saying I just checked. I've got 280 videos on this channel, and at least 250 of them are on uh, the use of Shopsmith tools. So I'm not going to repeat everything I've already said. Um, you, sh you should be able to get your answers among those videos. But let let's just, I got a list here. Let's, let's go through some of these criticisms. Um, assembly difficulty. He repeatedly mentioned that the assembly process was confusing and frustrating. I get that. I mean, if you've never assembled a Shopsmith multi purpose tool, it's going to be an alien tool to you. But one thing you got to remember John, you weren't assembling a table saw and you weren't assembling a drill press, and you weren't assembling a lathe. You were assembling five tools when you assembled that one tool. Um, when, you, when you did your alignment, you were aligning five tools. I don't, I don't know, we, we didn't see everything that you did, and I think a lot of the commenters are assuming that you basically threw away the manual. Some of the things I saw you doing later in the video implied to me that you took a look at the manual. I, I, I credit you for that. Um, in fact, in your comment back to me, you even mentioned that you watched a couple of my videos in preparation for yours. So, you know, way to go. Um, but I, we do pools a disservice and we do want to be woodworkers and makers a disservice if we imply that it's OK to throw the manual away. You know, we all remember Norm. Say I'd also like to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read understand and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. I hope that you did that. Um, but remember, when you're assembling this machine, if you take your time, that time and care that you put into it will pay you back in accuracy and ease of use. Um, you also talked a lot about safety concerns. In fact, the title of your video, I believe, was pretty misleading, talking about the world's most dangerous tool. Really? There are statistics about these things, and it ain't the shopsmith, I can tell you that. Um, one of the things you complained about was the fact that you said the, uh, the saw arbor was locked onto uh, the spindle with a single set screw and how that was scary and dangerous and all. No, it's not. That was patented back in the 1940s and has proven to be quite a successful way of mounting a saw blade. The arbors, or the shafts on this machine, have what's called a tapered flat. There's not just a flat surface where the set screw is setting, it's tapered. And if you even make the slightest attempt to tighten that set screw, that arbor will, will wedge itself if it begins to shift off of the shaft. You mentioned at one point in your video that you bet you know what's happening, you bet it was that set screw, and then you cut away. No, it wasn't. It was the carriage lock. You did not have the carriage lock locked on your machine and the table. Who knows? Maybe you didn't even have the headstock locked. Look, John, all of you potential Shopsmith users, there is a five point safety check. I've done a video on this. Every time you set this machine up as a drill press, as a lathe, as a horizontal boring machine, as a disc sander, as a table saw, any one of the functions, you should always make a quick run through those five things. You check to make sure the table tilt lock is locked in place if the table's installed. You make the sure the make sure that the carriage is locked, which you didn't do. You make sure that the table is at the proper height and locked in place on the carriage. Who knows if you did that? You make sure the headstock is locked and that the quill is either locked or unlocked, depending upon what operation you're doing. 
you didn't do those things, therefore you had an issue. It sounds like a lot of stuff to check, but you're checking the exact, thing, exact same things regardless of what tool you're wanting the shopsmith to be. You know what? Let's loosen this set screw on this machine. I want to show you something. All right, I'm not going to turn this on because mama didn't raise no fool. But what I will show you is if that, if that blade were to slide off, I want you to notice that that table insert has little tabs built into it that would prevent the blade even from making contact with the insert. Right? You see the blade teeth are not touching the insert. This is spinning freely on the end of that armor. Nope, not going to hurt you. Blade cannot fly off of this machine. Okay, another one of uh, John's comments had to do about durability. And in fact, he was talking about the plastic coupling. Really had a lot of fun talking bad about this. <laughs> well, I'll tell you is I've never had one break in use. I have had one break when it got sucked into the dust collector and went through the impeller. But it's made from a special nylon. It's a DuPont nylon called Zytel. It's been made from that material since some point in, in the 1950s. In the earlier days, they used to use a, a rubber and aluminum version, and the rubber would shear. And some of the comments about it being something of a, of a fail-safe, it's exactly what it is. It is designed so that if you're running a board across your joiner or through your planer, and that would suddenly stop that tool, it's to prevent that stopping from breaking the machine. Now, what would you rather do? Have to take the whole machine apart and, ex and replace an expensive part or replace a little plastic part? But that said, they don't break. Um, again, I, I think you can see from the comments on John's video, it's a pretty rare occurrence. By the way, if you don't take the time to properly align your accessories, such as the bandsaw, the joiner, and the shaft is being uh, driven at an angle, then they will wear at the shoulder. It's a one-time alignment, John, a one-time alignment. Then every time you take your bandsaw off and put it back on, it's perfectly aligned. There's nothing fusty about it. Another one of John's comments uh, seemed to imply that you had to buy a bunch of other accessories for this tool to be useful. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, when you buy a table saw, it always comes with a variety of saw blades and a dado blade set. You know, you, you wouldn't ever have to buy an accessory like that. <laughs> you know, the, the Shopsmith company um, has been producing this machine for so many years. They've really got it dialed in. They have a basic accessory kit that you can purchase. They have more advanced kits. One error that a lot of people make is they don't think through the kind of woodworking they intend on doing. And so they think, well, I, I guess I need a bandsaw, when maybe they don't need a bandsaw. Or I guess I need a joiner. Well, if you're not building cabinets, and if you're not building things from solid wood, furniture cabinets, you probably don't need a, uh, a joiner. So you got to think these things through before you make these decisions. I don't know of many people that need to own everything that Shopsmith manufactures. So um, now it, it, you're, you're only as reliant as you need to be. They used to have a tagline, the tool to begin with or the tool to start with and the system you can grow with. Now, that said, if you look back behind my machine, you might notice a chop saw. Um, people who own Shopsmith tools, as their wallets increase and as their space increases, sometimes go on to buy other companies' tools as well. But the sweet spot for the Shopsmith is working in a small spot and helping to maximize the use of that space. Now, John also mentioned an underpowered motor. When the Shopsmith Mark V was introduced in 1955, it had a three-quarter horse motor. In 1962, they made a change to the internal organs of that machine to uh, incorporate that slipping that's necessary. And uh, at that point, they upped the motor horsepower to one and an eighth horsepower. Shopsmith today still produces that machine. That's the mechanical variable speed with the dial on the front, like you own, John. Um, but they also make an electronic variable speed machine. The motor inside of that can develop two horsepower, and that motor is made by Technatool, the company you may know as Nova. Yeah, Nova, the people that make lathes and drill presses. So um, Shopsmith Tools, if you want the, to spend the money, you can have a more powerful, um, in fact, a much broader range of speeds than 
I have found necessary. Cost versus value. Uh, John kind of mentioned the fact that it's not worth the cost given his experience. Well, I, I don't know what he means by that because he talked about how they're incredibly inexpensive in the used market. I don't see how you can complain about the cost. Now, if you want to talk about a brand new, new unit being made in Dayton, Ohio on this very day, yeah, it's going to be more expensive. You know, they are paying people that live in Dayton, Ohio, and that's a posh area. I'm originally from Dayton, so I know. Um, but, but there's how many years? 70 years of tools on the used market, which, by the way, says something. These tools do last. And if you'd rather save the money, then go ahead and buy a used tool. Um, you'll find they're built like battleships, and they'll work just fine. John also criticized that they're difficult to use. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give him this because, you know, you walk up to a table saw and if it's set up with the proper blade and the miter gauge is on there, it's fairly intuitive what you need to do next. If you walk up to a shopsmith and it's currently set up as a drill press and you need to make a cut, you may not know what to do. So this is part of the reason why my channel exists. This is the reason why Shopsmith includes that hardback power tool woodworking for every one book. Um, in fact, when you buy a Shopsmith, you even get a self-study course that you can work your way through to better understand that tool. Um, so is it intuitive? No, nah, it's not as intuitive as individual tools. However, it's one tool, sits in the end of your shop or your garage along with your car, and uh, it makes, makes room for you. John throughout was talking about stability and reliance. As he was misaligning the hubs and looking at vibration, of the plastic coupling. Uh, not the best place to judge <laughs> uh, reliability and durability and such. Uh, now, that's uh, when, when properly assembled, properly aligned, you don't have any of that nonsense going on. So one comment that I made that was actually a quote from an engineer at Shopsmith is he referred to the Shopsmith machine as the thinking man's tool. And somebody immediately jumped on that and, and said that that was funny. Um, you know, hey, you, you do have to put some thought and care into your woodworking. And uh, if you're working with a multi-purpose tool, any multi-purpose tool, even a leather man, you need to know how to use the tool. So in that, in that sense, it is a thinking man's tool. Now, let me please expand that. It's a thinking person's tool. Thinking about my sister, Lisa, <laughs> and lots of other female users of these tools. Quick little background. Um, I did work for Shopsmith back in the 1980s and 1990s, but since 1999, I've been a corporate trainer for the American subsidiary of a German cabinet hardware company. Um, so one thing about me is I travel a bit and I've earned a few Delta Sky Miles and a few Hilton Honors Points. So based on that, I'd like to issue a quick little throwdown to John. John? I would love to come visit you on my own dime. I would be happy to spend a little bit of time getting your machine tuned in. And uh, maybe at that point, we can each turn a camera on and talk a little bit about the machine one more time. Um, if you want to do a throwdown where we actually build something together, I'd love to do that as well. But uh, I just want to throw it out to you. And if you'd rather me bring my trailer, I would be happy to pay you back every dime that you paid on that equipment. I'm dead serious. Reach out to me. Um, you, there's lots of ways to find me. So I'll, I'll, we'll see how clever you are. Um, <laughs> and uh, I hope to hear from you.